I'm at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, which is uh, I'm at the basic science arm of the Sloan Kettering Institute, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, and uh, I was asked to talk about what we might be able to do, and just introduce the speakers here, they're going to tell us much more about their concrete ideas for streamlining molecular simulations data. And it's a quite a broad topic. Um, just to give you a bit of background about myself, my lab does a lot of molecular simulation of all kinds. We try to develop quantitatively accurate models for uh, predicting biomolecular small molecule uh, design, basically, um, as well as how mutations in patient populations actually translate into sensitivity resistance or anticipating drug resistance. We also simulate other things like nanoparticles. We have a giant automated wet lab, which is a big 24-foot robot, so we work a lot on how to automate and understand things from molecular uh, uh, biophysical experiments, and there's a lot of other cool things in terms of simulating protein-protein interactions we're getting into, but uh, we're also a member of the Folding at Home Consortium, so we generate very large data sets and would love to share, um, but we just need a, to, a way to enable this. So what I'm going to tell you about, at least in this introductory part, is um, these are some of the, there are, there are some significant challenges facing our field, and I think everybody has an idea of what these are, but I wanted to explicitly name some of them just to get us thinking about um, how are there, are there technological solutions or community solutions we can come up with that try to overcome some of these challenges. Now, we talked a lot about interoperability, right? I grew up in the Ember community, and it's very different for the Charm community. Here are stories about, for example, uh, someone in Charlie Brooks's group would uh, develop a new GD model, and then the next graduate student would spend a whole graduate student career next door trying to implement it into Ember and Dave Case's group. And we want to avoid that kind of balkanization of these communities where people can't easily contribute from one package to the other. Um, uh, also, in uh, doing things like predictive modeling for protein ligand binding affinities, we run these blind challenges all the time. E3R is one run by Mike Wilson and Rami Amaro, where they're looking at data from uh, pharm pharmaceutical companies, and it's blinded until the point where people predict it, and then try to see how well they did at predicting protein ligand affinities. Sample looks at those in, uh, for simpler protein ligand systems, and, and also for physical chemical properties development and drug discovery. But it's really hard for us to compare performance because nobody uses standard data sets except for these blind challenges. Um, so somebody will publish a, a, their own method and compare on a particular data set. Nobody else uses the same data set to compare it, so we don't know which one is better unless we go with a predictive challenge. But unfortunately, most of these predictive challenges test things that are not the methodology or the, the force field. They test unrelated choices that people have made in putting things together. So when you're trying to set up a biomolecular simulation, you have to make a ton of decisions, and everybody makes these decisions differently for different reasons. Uh, we hope that there might be some best practices, and that's what LiveComs, this journal, is trying to establish in certain domains, at least. But still, most of the time, we end up uh, testing which of these random decisions have you made differently, rather than how is your method better than another method. And I, we're really trying to evaluate the technology. We'd like to evaluate, like, um, which, which technology is doing better at uh, navigating this very complex uh, design problem, but we end up mostly evaluating the driver. So if somebody set up the wrong protonation state for a ligand and gets a really weird ligand binding affinity because of that, that's usually what we see in these challenges, not the differences in you know, one free energy method being better than a free energy method. So we need some way to separate the skill of the, the driver from the actual technologies as well. Um, and the other thing is that people like me who like to focus on different algorithm approaches for building better tools for predicting binding free energies or binding modes or designing small molecules, we would really like to focus our creative efforts on a particular part of this whole thing, but we end up having to worry about literally everything we need to do on the previous slide to set up our molecular systems. And uh, that's, to some, some degree, ameliorated by things like MemProt and MD, which we're going to hear about in just a bit, um, where they've done all of these best practices, uh, set up things for you, but there's still lots of other places one has to worry about. The industry also comes, uh, shows up at these uh, blind challenge prediction meetings like T3R over and over because they want to learn about what are the best practices. They don't have time to do, time to do comprehensive evaluations, so they'd like to figure out who's performing the best consistently in predicting protein ligand interactions and how can I implement those procedures within my own organization, but it's really difficult if there's not a clear way of describing what those best practices are and actually reproducing them in another laboratory. Um, what you might, uh, so for example, if you're just going to set up a free energy calculation in GROMAX, actually this is just a, a standard uh, molecular simulation where you're computing the RMS deviation. These are all of the stages you have to go through in, in general to go from one end to the other. And if you're, uh, if you're interested in doing science in that one little cube, you still have to do all of this other stuff in order to get there. And every choice you make along the way is going to impact your results. Um, so it really makes it quite frustrating if you're, if you're trying to focus on this part, but want to leave everything else to the, be of the best practices to the community, to people who know all of those uh, steps a lot better than you, then it's, it's quite difficult to, to have that kind of focus. 
Um, research reproducibility we've already spoken about, but um, really what we'd love to do is you know, build on the work of others. We'd like to take some great idea that somebody had, some baseline method. We, we think we have a better idea for how to improve this part. And uh, we'd like to do it better and implement it and then start by reproducing that work and carry it forward. But I've had enormous trouble uh, trying to reproduce the work that other people publish uh, in nearly all cases. Um, and so if, if we can't even reproduce that work, it's really hard to use that as a starting point for going forward. Instead, you usually just pick a completely different approach and make shortcuts everywhere else. <laughs> Um, also, translating these best performers from the blind challenges into real production pipelines that can use in industry is almost impossible for the same reason. Um, deployment is actually quite difficult. Uh, everybody here is trying very hard to make their software as easy to use as possible, as easy to install as possible. A lot of people are using Conda, right, everybody? Um, uh, but still, even though our software is installable in one line with Conda, we Merck paid us a, to have a post op fly out every three months just to make sure it was working on their batch queue system. And uh, it, that sort of thing is something that we like to avoid. Um, so training is also a huge problem. Um, uh, let's see, there's, there's a, uh, a big problem in the United States because all the baby boomers are retired from pharma. So there's a lot of jobs that are open over the next few years in computational modeling. Um, but training the next generation of chemists is actually quite difficult because we, you know, we don't even know uh, how to include what the best practices are in a way that makes it easy for someone to learn what that is and why that is. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's quite difficult. Um, funding is also very difficult, uh, both from industry and from academic institutions, or, or uh, federal institu uh, institutions that would like to give money to academics because they'd like to see something for their investment. The research paper is not the overall product. They would like to invest in a, a tool that other people could use. And the problem is that if nobody else can use it, then it's really a, a, a not a worthwhile investment. Um, and both, both the, uh, the program officers from federal agencies and uh, industry people have said time after time uh, that this is really a problem. They don't like seeing their funding dollars totally wasted this way. So this is not a workshop about workflows, but workflows are kind of the solution to all of these problems. Uh, they solve the interoperability and evaluation issue. They allow us to take the same workflow and then use it again on other kinds of data. Uh, but to make those sorts of ideas work, and there's other workshops focused on those, we really need standards or common data models that allow us to move data through different parts of this simulation, through that entire uh, flow of, of what I showed you for Gromax workflows, for example. So if you have your modeling tool that you want to use, and, and for example, it, it could be in a Docker container, or it could, it could just be bits of Python you use together, you want to be able to take data sets and shove them through a standard best practice uh, preparation pipelines, but, uh, and into your modeling tool and then through automated data analysis tools. But to do that, you really need standardized models to allow you to move data through each of the different stages of this. Um, the preparation pipeline, if you did have uh, ways of pushing data back and forth in a standard way, we could actually try a bunch of different ways of doing that and figure out which ones perform consistently best across a suite of modeling tools to even find what best practices are and have a good, good set of evidence about why they are the best practices at the, the current time. Um, so, but you need a lot of different kinds of standardized common data models in order to actually be able to do this. On the, uh, for a biomolecular system, we need to replace the itching PDB format. We need to handle things like parameter sets. Uh, it has to be a robust open reader and writer that everybody can share. Um, we need ways of describing small molecules in a better way. We already talked about that a little bit earlier and pushing them over the internet. Output data, we were just talking about how trajectory data needs to move through, um, but also any computed physical properties might need to be carried through in some way. If you're looking at things like structures or clusters, they might need some way to be expressed as well. How would, can we quantify uncertainty and then propagate that through? That's also very important. And then how do we assess anything uh, is also a big question. So all of these in principle need some way of defining a common data model between different bits of tools that, that might go back and forth. Uh, and there's different granularities of interoperability at this level. You could have, for example, this dream of importing uh, uh, OpenMM next to Gromax and sharing potential definitions or sharing different parts of the tools where there's just a common data model that allows us to move things back and forth at the Python level, or it could be at a much uh, coarser grain level where you say, my tool lives in a Docker container with a little Python driver to advertise its, its capabilities and to allow me to move data in and out of the Docker container and have it operate at a coarse grain scale. And maybe there's a DOI resolvable repository of those containers that goes along with my paper. So we can think of anything along this scale as allowing us to, to uh, facilitate and really streamline our ability to move data from one tool to another tool throughout the whole uh, simulation lifetime. 
there's a, a particular challenge I wanted to highlight, which is how do we describe what it is we're simulating? And I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, you know, just describing what's in my simulation so somebody can search it later is important, but also describing to the force field so that it can apply parameters it turns out to be super important. I'll mention the open force field uh, initiative in just a second, but um, the, you know, this is what it might look like to a biologist where we say we expressed human able kinase T315I, that's a mutant, uh, isoform 1A residues 242 through 493, this is the Uniprop um, uh, identifier, fused to an N-terminal HIS6TEV tag that was then cleaved with TEP protease, which leaves a little bit of an N-terminal overhang, uh, incubated high concentration to induce autophosphorylation, so you need to know which thing was phosphorylated, um, assays were run in 100 microliters of one micromolar kinase, and an assay buffer, which is 20 millimolar trace buffer PH8 with uh, 50 millimolar NACL, that's the actual one we use for assays, uh, to which we add 100 nanoliters of 10 millimolar DMSO stock of the MATHIP. So you need to know what protonation state and what tautomers are relevant for that. So all of this has to get turned into some sort of structured file that the force field can actually act on and figure out, you know, what, what am I going to actually be parameterizing, what parameters do I want to assign? And this is a non-trivial process to even describe or come up with some sort of uh, scheme of translating this into something that is structured and that's something that we can share in search. There's some things to help us, right? There's, I uh, just mentioned SMILES or INSHI. INSHI is developed by NIST to describe their mass spectroscopy database, and it looks like this, for example. I'm uh, sorry, it looks like more like this. <clears throat> but you can actually uh, have mixture INSHIs that also say, I'm um, combining these in different ways. So you can describe like a 25, 24, 1 uh, phenol chloroform uh, isoamyl alcohol in a TRIS buffer using this kind of uh, description. Uh, Uniprod is kind of a standard place we can get biopolymer information for proteins. There's also this thing called ISO 11238, which is used by the uh, Food and Drug Administration in the US in their GSAS, Global uh, Registry of um, uh, Additives for Things, which says what's in a pill. Um, the Molecular uh, Software Sciences Institute has worked with us to be the intermediary uh, for something called the Open Force Field Consortium, which is a group of home interested um, uh, industry uh, that has signed on to sponsor the production of open source tools and uh, open force fields, which is super cool. And this legal model can be used for other interest groups as well. So there's other academic groups that would like to get money from industry that can see me or, or Daniel about how we set up the legal infrastructure to take multiple uh, companies from around the world and funnel their funds into open source software. But the cool thing is that we're trying to define some data, or we don't want them to necessarily be standards, but they could be if there are other people are interested, but we just needed some way of representing things like what is, what is in your simulation system what molecule species uh, are, are there uh, in a way that can actually work between different kind of uh, chemical informatics toolkits. Um, we're also working on automated benchmarking against biophysical data sets. The question is how do you represent a biophysical experiment and what, what it was done on in a standard uh, computable way. And so there's some standards like NIST ThermoML, which is an IUPAC standard for uh, describing mixture liquid properties, uh, but there's some others that need to be developed for, for biophysical experiments. And then we have a, what we think is a really good contribution to how to define how to transfer parameters to given systems or how to describe how parameters are supposed to be assigned for biomolecular systems. And you can read all about that here. Um, so with that, I want to stop and uh, introduce the two speakers that will follow me. So Philip Stansfeld, uh, it was uh, my pleasure to meet uh, this weekend, um, comes from Oxford and has done some really cool things with automating sort of best practices for simulation preparation with this MEMPRO theory. We're using it in our own laboratory right now to grab porin structures uh, to simulate uh, permeation of small, mole small molecule antimicrobials through porins. And then you'll hear a bit from Christopher Woods, who's been doing some great work with both Simul and now with uh, BioSimSpace to try to really show what, what the future could be like for how, how simple it could be to do molecular simulations, for example, in Jupyter Notebooks, where different modules uh, move things back and forth through the cloud uh, to do a lot of these computations in a very facile manner. So we'll give you an idea of what might be possible and how we can move forward. All right, so without further ado, I'll let uh, Bill come up.